So welcome to the second day of our uh, workshop on regional inequality in Europe and the US. Uh, a warm welcome to all our listeners and especially to all our presenters we have today. So after six presentations yesterday, we will have even eight today. Um, I'm sure that we have as interesting presentations and a vivid uh, discussion afterwards. So again, a welcome from uh, Marian Feldman, Tom, Klaal, Alice, uh, and myself um, to, for uh, uh, your participation here. Um, maybe a brief introduction. We have three sessions uh, today. We start with a three presentation session um, right now, and uh, then uh, we switch moderators uh, for the next session. Again, as yesterday, we have 25 minutes uh, presentation, then a very brief period for uh, questions concerning uh, the understanding of the presentations, and then we have joint discussion, uh, discussion after um, all presentations uh, were done. So um, let's start with the uh, first um, block of uh, presentations. Uh, again, as yesterday, we tried to mix uh, perspectives from the US and from Europe, um, and uh, again, mixed topics as well. Uh, so we uh, will have uh, in this uh, session one presentation uh, focusing on the US and especially on a very hot topic in the US today and probably during the next days and, and weeks. Um, then we uh, skip to Europe and have more uh, uh, historical perspective over the last uh, 30 years, how inequality in uh, um, Sweden uh, developed. And then we go back uh, to the US uh, and focus on a peculiar topic uh, on smart cities. So that's the first session. Uh, we start with Andres Rodriguez Posse. Uh, he is a professor uh, of economic geography at the London School of Economics. Andres, we are looking forward to your presentation. The floor is yours. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dirk. And let me just uh, share my screen to you so you can see the presentation, and hopefully everyone can see can hear me. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, oh, and I just went to the last slide, so I have to go all the way back suddenly. Thank you very much to the Institute for Economic uh, Research and Policy and for the Creator Institute at the Keen Institute of uh, Private Enterprise. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you, albeit uh, um, in this virtual form. I wish I could have been in a, in a more physical form. It would have mean, uh, meant that the pandemic is, is getting better, which is, doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, right now, especially in, in Europe, where we seem to be heading all of us towards uh, a new round of confinements. The topic that I'm proposing today is uh, very much linked to the whole topic of inequalities in the US and in Europe. Uh, I'm going to focus in the case of the US. This is a, a new paper that just came out of the oven, written with uh, my colleagues Neil Lee and Cornelius uh, Lipp. And uh, I'm going to try whenever possible to refer also to the same sort of situation that we have witnessed in Europe, because I do think that the trends with some differences, both in the US and in the case of Europe, uh, have got considerable uh, similarities. And let me just start by uh, going back to 20 years ago, to 2020, when uh, uh, one of our esteemed colleagues and probably one of the most influential uh, sociologist and political scientist uh, at the moment, uh, Robert Putnam, made a prediction. In that year, in 2000, he published uh, the book uh, Bowling Alone, which has probably become the most cited uh, book in this field of social sciences in this century, in which, in that prediction, he was uh, mainly highlighting that there had been a significant change in the way American society was working, that Americans, rather than America or North America, a society that had thrived on social capital, was starting to bowl alone. That people no longer bowled with friends, they no longer bowled with clubs, they no longer competed in bowling leagues, but they were going to bowling alleys on their own just to uh, pass the time. And of course, he used that as fundamentally a metaphor for 
all sorts of decline in civic engagement, political participation, and therefore in social capital, which has been, according to him, a trend since the late 1960s. And this metaphor was mainly a representation of what was happening across American society. It was not just that Americans were bowling less with colleagues, with peers, with friends. It was not that just uh, they were playing less sports or collective sports and more individual sports, but there was lower political, political participation, lower vote, voter turnout, newspaper readership, personal letter writing, club meetings, visiting, car playing, charitable giving, volunteering, church attendance, any type of collective endeavors that had been the norm were on the wane in the case of the US. But this happened in parallel to another important process, which is at the center of the conference uh, today, which was the rise of inequality. That since the mid 1960s and especially the 1970s, uh, the American society that relative to Europe was significantly more unequal in terms of interpersonal divisions or variations in wealth and in income had, was becoming far more uh, unequal than it had been before after a period in the early post-war period of reduction of those disparities. And that this combination on the one hand of declining social capital and greater inequality was representing a serious threat to democracy and therefore should be addressed. And the question is, uh, to what extent was Putnam right? Uh, was there a threat to US democracy? And what I'm going to try to argue is that yes, it was probably the case, especially in light of what happened in the 2016 elections. We don't know what's going to happen on, on Tuesday. We'll have to wait and see. But that this threat might not have come from the declining social capital and the rise and the greater level of interpersonal inequality or their combination, but it might have been driven to a large extent by another type of inequality that is also at the heart of this conference, which is the long-term economic decline and uh, demographic decline of uh, midtown America, of uh, small city uh, towns and rural areas across uh, the US. And as a result of that, of course, the result, uh, the, the rise in interterritorial inequality. And that this factor is combined and has been stronger in those places that have stronger social capital as understood by Robert Putnam, not weaker social capital. So this has led uh, to what has been identified in many parts of the Western world, especially in Europe, as a geography of discontent by people like Phil McCann, as uh, in the case of the US, uh, what uh, Kathy Kramer at the University of Wisconsin calls uh, a policies, uh, politics of resentment, or what I call in the end, the revenge of the places that don't matter, places that have been neglected, that have been overlooked by policy, that have been told. And I'm going to use uh, Hillary Clinton's words uh, that they are deplorables, that uh, very often they live in places uh, that are flyover states or that are rust belts that have decided enough is enough, we matter and we're going to make a difference. So let me start with uh, whether the prediction was fulfilled. And you probably, many of you have seen these maps already, which are the results of the November 2016 elections that to the surprise of many uh, return as president Donald Trump, a candidate that uh, just one year ago, one year before the election, no one expected had any chance of winning the election. And I would say probably 10 days before the election, uh, the odds were entirely against him. But he managed to secure the nomination against all odds uh, of uh, the Republican Party. And also he managed to secure uh, uh, the presidency. What you see on the left uh, side is the vote for the Republican Party in red and the vote for the Democrats in, in, right, but, uh, in, in blue. But what I'm in really interested is on the map on the right, which is not the share of the vote for Donald Trump, but the swing towards Donald Trump, uh, which is in addition to uh, 
previous votes for Republican candidates. So this is what uh, we call the Trump margin, which is the difference in the share of vote at county level for all counties in the US between Donald Trump uh, or uh, Donald Trump's election in 2016 and votes for the previous uh, mainstream Republican uh, candidate Mitt Romney in 2012. As you can see in the map, there are quite a few areas of the US, especially in the south and out west, in, this, uh, in the southwest, all the way from New Mexico to Southern California, where the share of vote for Donald Trump, that vote that can be more of seen as a protest vote, as a vote um, against uh, the system, as a more, if you want to call it this way, populist vote, uh, uh, was uh, lower than the vote for Mitt Romney. The concentration of the Trump margin, the swing towards Trump, was in an arc that goes all the way from Maine in the Northeast to North Dakota in, uh, in the center of the US, uh, around the Great Lakes in many areas that had been uh, the traditional industrial centers of the US and uh, had been declared or had been considered as a Rust Belt for quite some time in recent uh, decades. And the question is, why did it happen? Why did it happen in 2016? And why did it happen in the places uh, where it happened that, uh, despite the fact that Hillary Clinton won the election and won uh, the popular vote because of the electoral college system, uh, securing the key states of Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan and Wisconsin by a margin. If you have to remember that the combined win for Trump uh, between Pennsylvania, Michigan and Ohio was uh, close to 180,000 votes. I think in the case of Michigan was just 11,000. So why does this happen? And there are three potential explanations. One is uh, social capital and this erosion of social capital. So we're going back to Putnam here. This idea that uh, uh, the lower engagement, civic engagement and political participation of many Americans has created a more fertile ground for the emergence and the success of uh, fringe candidates, of marginal candidates, of candidates that just two decades ago, one decade ago, would be considered as having no chance of securing the presidency. And yet today we have one as a president of the US. Um, the geography of this is a uh, type of social capital and social capital understood in the way that Putnam has proposed. And this is data from the University of Pennsylvania uh, is uh, that there are many places in the US where social capital is low, uh, fundamentally around the south of the US, especially in eastern in Tennessee, in Kentucky, but also in the southwest, all the way from New Mexico to southern California, uh, is also low in big cities. Uh, you can see uh, New York, you can see Los Angeles there, San Francisco, for example, Chicago, relatively low in comparison to the surrounding areas. And it's fundamentally concentrated in parts of the Great Plains and mountain states, all the way from the Dakotas, Iowa, uh, Nebraska, Kansas, into Oklahoma, and then to the west from Wyoming, Montana, into Idaho, that's where you have the biggest concentration of social capital understood in the way proposed by uh, Putnam. Uh, then the second was the levels of interpersonal inequality. Um, we have a society in the US that is highly polarized and has become more highly polarized. And this is something that has not been just identified by uh, Robert Putnam, but by a host of social scientists and uh, uh, economists. Uh, of particular relevance in recent years has been the work of Rashetti, but also Piketty and Saez, Milanovic, in the case of Europe, where the process is very similar, or relatively similar, uh, the work of Danny Dorling. And there has been increasingly a link between this idea of rising inequality, the presence of more vulnerable individuals uh, from an economic perspective, and uh, the rise of economic insecurity, and the vote for anti-system uh, parties or anti-system candidates uh, in the works of Giso and colleagues or Gitron and Hall. And uh, these people at left behind at risking or falling into poverty are deemed to be reacting to a system that no longer delivers for them. Uh, 
and are rejecting, according to Branko Milanovic, the status quo and creating an erosion of democratic institutions, leading to the rise of nativism and plutocracy. And uh, when we look at this levels of interpersonal inequality, in the case of uh, the US at county level, we see also that uh, there's a very distinct geography from that of uh, the levels of uh, social capital uh, with the highest levels found mainly in the south, all the way from Florida to Texas and, and New Mexico. Uh, also in cities, you can see here Los Angeles, uh, San Francisco, Chicago, uh, New York, uh, Philadelphia, etc. But it was lowest in those areas very often of uh, the Midwest, of the Great Plains, the areas around the Great Lakes that have also been declining over time. And the third one is, uh, well, before I get to the third one, it might be also a factor of that combination as Putnam was highlighting. This idea that uh, uh, there's a reason to think that the twin trends of, on the one hand, uh, decline in social capital and levels and rise in inequality would also create, uh, put the whole system and American democracy in uh, jeopardy. But there's a third factor that I'm going to dwell, and this, this is a curious one, uh, not because it's not important, but because uh, despite the fact that Putnam's work is all about all sorts of decline from uh, card letter writing to club meetings, etc., cetera, um, there's one decline that has been ongoing, that's ongoing and has been uh, prevalent in, in many parts of the US for quite some time, which is the territorial decline of Midtown and rural America for quite some time, which might be like it has been in the case of Europe at the root of this reaction at the ballot box. And if we take a look at uh, different types of decline, we can look and we're going to be looking at employment decline, uh, declining wages and salaries, a decline in income, uh, decline in population. Uh, we take one element and we look at it over a long period from 1980 to 2016, the year of the election of Donald Trump. And we see that, for example, in terms of employment, there has been a greater polarization across the US. You have uh, rises in employment along the Pacific coast, all the way from, all the way from Washington state to uh, Arizona, but also in uh, parts of the uh, east, especially in the megalopolis going from Washington to Boston and in uh, South and Florida. But there has been far lower levels of employment growth in many midtown and rural areas and especially in a nexus that goes all the way from North Dakota in the north on the border with Canada to the eastern part, sorry, the western part of Texas in the south on the border uh, with uh, Mexico. So the question is, how do these factors combine in order to uh, facilitate or have facilitated the election of Donald Trump? And what I'm going to propose is a model. Uh, we have 25 minutes. Uh, I don't think this is the time and the moment to, to go into a model with Greek letters. So I have decided to simplify in which what uh, Neil, Cornelius and I are trying to see is what determined this swing towards Donald Trump between the two elections, so 2012 and 2016, so the Trump margin. And uh, we're looking first at a series of factors that may be related to uh, this swing and that has been highlighted as by most of the literature on anti-system voting and the rise of populism as drivers or differences in wealth, differences in education, differences in density, differences in or racial composition of the population that is particularly important in the case of the US relative to the situation of Europe. And of course we have something that we cannot explain which is the residual term that we try to uh, reduce by also introducing a lot of uh, additional factors, but also mainly uh, state fix effects. And our three variables of interest, which are the uh, level of social capital in every country in the US in the prior to the 2016 election, the level of interpersonal inequality within a county and the long term uh, level of economic decline measured in those four uh, dimensions that I highlighted, which are income, size on wages, uh, employment, and uh, population. And uh, before going into that, and very briefly, I just want to highlight that none of the factors that uh, 
which are the factors of interest, changes in demographic and economic changes, so in this case, changes in employment, uh, levels of inequality or levels of social capital per se, individually seems to be able to explain uh, the swing towards Donald Trump. In most cases, what you see is either that the regression lines, the, uh, in this case, are flat, or if they are not flat, like for example, in the link between employment change and the Trump margin, they tend to be have a very limited, very uh, small slope and not to be significant in, in any case. And the relationship between the three variables of interest, inequality, employment change, and social capital, are, is similarly not very strong and not very significant. So it's not that one factor alone can explain it, it's the combination of these factors in combination with all the other determinants, race, density, education, and the like that have been highlighted previously by, by the literature. So what do we get as, as, as a result? And I'm going back again to the icons. Uh, there's a lot of work behind this. There are a lot of results. The results are very robust. And there's a paper that you will get the link at the end of the presentation where you can then load the paper and take a look at the, the results if you're interested in far greater detail. Let me just start by looking at the control variables that are not highlighted here. But uh, the control variables go with expectations. Uh, the first one, and one of the most significant ones, is density, which is uh, a factor that has been strongly highlighted in the work of people like Jonathan Rodden in his seminal book uh, published last year. The idea that uh, the higher the density uh, in, in a place, the lower the increase in the Trump uh, margin. So that the idea that big cities have swung less towards, the, or did swung, uh, swing less towards uh, Donald Trump that was the case in uh, less densely populated suburbs, in small cities, and in uh, or towns, and in rural areas. Uh, the same uh, applies for education. More educated counties saw so a lower swing uh, for Donald Trump. And in race, which is a, a very important factor, counties with a, a higher share of white population, white non-Latino non population, uh, saw a greater increase in the swing towards Donald Trump, whereas the presence of minorities, and especially the presence of a black minor minority, uh, did uh, limit the swing towards uh, Donald Trump. So that goes in line with expectations. What is a bit more surprising is what we get in terms of uh, our variables of interest. Let me start first by here, the right to with the levels of interpersonal inequality within a, a county. Uh, and here what we find is uh, nothing in general. That despite the fact that the US in comparison to Europe has got a greater level of interpersonal inequality and interpersonal inequalities in the US are far more important in relative terms, uh, relative to Europe especially, than territorial inequalities, there seems to be no connection between interpersonal inequality and uh, the swing towards Trump. If anything, it goes in the reverse of what Putnam was saying. And this explains why, for example, the poorest of the poor, to put one example, the uh, mainly minority black population living in the ghettos of uh, Northern Philadelphia voted for Clinton as did the riches of the rich, uh, which are probably the, the white elite living in the uh, suburbs of West Philadelphia. They voted together Whereas once you moved out of Philadelphia and the surrounding counties into a uh, small town in rural Pennsylvania, it was mainly a big swing towards uh, Donald Trump. What we find is that there's a very strong connection between employment decline over time and a swing towards Donald Trump. This is measured from 1980 until 2016. And this is very much connected to social capital. But if you take a look at here, my uh, bowls are instead of being in the right uh, way, they are upside down, uh, mainly because it's against what Trump was saying. It's not in the places with low social capital that this happened, it's in the places with strong social capital, in which we suspect that this is something that would have to be developed, that strong social capital becomes a conductive mechanism to facilitate the swing in the vote uh, towards, in this case, more liberal uh, and uh, uh, anti-system type of options, if you want, populist options. Um, when we look at the different types of decline, 
what we find, and this is interesting, is that these are the types of decline that are more connected to the territorial decline of a place are the ones that are significant. We find no connection between decline in income and in wages and salaries and the Trump margin, but there's a very strong connection when we look at two factors, which are decline in employment and decline in population, which is in contrast to what we see find in Europe, that we find that more anti-system vote in Europe is connected to long-term industrial declines in wealth uh, and in, in GDP per capita and in industrial output in the areas that we look at Europe. And this also changes over time. It's not something that has, uh, sorry, uh, is enduring over time. It's not something that has appeared or is the result of short-term uh, short changes. It's something that has been ongoing for quite some time. We control for changes in employment, in uh, population, in income, and in wages and salaries from 1970 until 2016. And we do it over different uh, lengths of, uh, of time between 1970 and 2016, 1980 to 2016, and so on until just covering six years. So the crisis 2010 until 2016. And what we find is that across these two variables, employment decline and population decline, uh, it's both a long-term and a short-term factor. The places that have been witnesses witnessing uh, a decline for the longest periods are also those that are returning, uh, that are less happy with the system and have decided that they're going to go uh, towards a candidate that is going to shake up the system, is going to shake up the tree. So what can we conclude from this? How can we take stock? Uh, I would argue that uh, Putnam made a prediction and that prediction overlooked a fundamental factor, which is the long-term rise in territorial inequalities, especially from an economic and demographic uh, perspective uh, that seems to be driving populism in the US. Uh, that this long-term decline has created a very strong malaise across the, the whole of the US and many, especially in those areas that have witnessed the biggest decline in employment and in uh, population that is manifesting itself at the ballot box or has manifested uh, in 2016 at the ballot box. And this is far more relevant in determining the Trump vote in 2016 than other types of inequalities and fundamentally interpersonal inequalities. I'm not arguing that, arguing that interpersonal inequalities are not relevant. Uh, they are actually very important, but nevertheless, these are not the ones that set the ballot box alight uh, in 2016. They might do so. We've seen the reaction to the uh, killing of George Floyd in, uh, earlier this year and how they, that can drive tensions in the US. But at the moment, the decline in American communities, those communities that have seen better times, that have been dismissed uh, by the likes of Hillary Clinton as deplorables or people living in the Rust Belt or rednecks uh, in areas that are flyover states that have decided that enough is enough and they have exacted their revenge at the ballot box. So these are people that have decided that they are no longer bowling alone. At the moment, and hopefully not for long, in my, my opinion, they're, uh, they're golfing with Trump. We'll see what happens on, on Tuesday. But the risk is not that uh, they will golf with Trump alone, that they are going to continue to play ball, whether it is golf or bowling or playing American football or basketball or baseball or whatever, with whoever decides that is going to pay attention to their needs, to their plights, and whoever promises to reverse uh, the neglect and perceived disdain that has been brewing not just for a few years, but has been brewing for uh, decades. So this is a st structural problem that would need answers. And I would recommend that anyone, and hopefully Joe Biden, um, uh, if he emerges president uh, on Wednesday, uh, would pay particular attention to these problems because they might not, if not, we might be not playing golf with Trump, we might be playing whatever sort of sport 
with another candidate uh, of a similar ilk or even worse uh, in four, 10 or 15 or 20 years time. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Uh, a, a very uh, interesting presentation in general, but especially uh, in this week, uh, even more interesting. Uh, I hope that uh, Joe Biden is listening to it or maybe listened to it several weeks ago uh, <laughs> that he could um, change his campaign. Um, are there some questions for understanding to Andres? There are some questions in the uh, questions answer session, but I think they are all to content. Maybe you can uh, uh, ask one of them and uh, then come the, to the discussion later on. So, um, uh, Andres, uh, can you open the questions answer? Yes, uh, I can do that. I, I've just done it, but uh, I would. Uh, why don't you choose one from the, the chat and? And ask me the question then. Uh, I would just start with with the one from Torben, uh, and then we uh, uh, we collect the others for the general discussion uh, after all three presentations. So maybe just start with the first one. Okay. So the question, if I can see it here, is: uh, Can you say something about the fear of automation, expectation to lose a job in the future that affects the Trump margin? Um, these are factors that. Uh, thank you very much, Torben, for the. For the question these are factors that very much uh, uh, reinforce one another um, the fear of automation is mainly affecting many areas where you have uh, traditionally the the biggest concentration of uh, uh, manufacturing jobs in the us which are the areas that have been on the decline for quite some time um, this fear uh, is something that has created this vulnerability. It's a fear that uh, some authors like author have uh, called uh, the China sort of uh, syndrome and uh, has, has, is reinforcing the reaction in places with first on the one hand, the, the economic decline in the areas where these people live, where you have the biggest concentration of manufacturing in the US in areas very often that have relatively strong uh, social capital and probably is also driving to this unhappiness at the ballot box. Having said that, I think this is a factor that goes beyond uh, these uh, traditional rust belt and declining areas and increasingly uh, artificial intelligence and automation is going to affect a lot of jobs uh, that are less creative, that might be in services, quite uh, color jobs that uh, are like our these days concentrated in, in cities and many of them in big cities. And that would lead to possibly a significant reaction over time and significant challenges uh, that might create social and political problems, not just in the areas where we're seeing now a this rise of populism in the US or in the case of Europe, but also in other areas where many, much of the work uh, by urban economists have, has highlighted that these are the places that are going to drive the economic transformation and economic prosperity in the future. Okay, thank you. We have quite a lot of other questions, uh, but I think they are all uh, quite fitting uh, to the uh, discussion afterwards. So I would um, skip to the next presenter, uh, Andreas Erlström. Uh, from Lund University, he's a doctoral student there, and he will present a paper on uh, the development and inequality in Sweden starting in the 1990s. So um, really a long-term uh, perspective. Uh, Andreas, uh, the floor is yours. You have 25 minutes for presentation. Looking forward to it. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, this uh, is a presentation about an article uh, that I wrote together with Markus uh, Kilic and uh, uh, Ulahan, and I previously saw that uh, Marcus Kilic was in the audience at least. Uh, so uh, this presentation will be uh, in uh, five parts, uh, starting with uh, the research aim, the literature review, followed by the empirical material, uh, the findings that we found uh, that will be presented in two parts, leading up to the conclusions. 
So the research aims of the article was to position the question of scale within the research on in income and quantity uh, by examining the patterns and trends of spatial disparities across scale, uh, asking questions of where, when, and to what degree are spatial disparities undergoing changes, and if these pa uh, patterns of spatial disparities can be seen uh, across scale. And in our perspective, this is a missing perspective in the uh, discussion on regional inequalities. Uh, often we use uh, uniscale approaches when drawing our conclusions. Uh, and often we are focusing either on regional level or met metropolitan level. So uh, when we started to get an overview of the literature, we first and foremost need to say that the, there is a vast and fragmented literature on e uh, economic inequality with different scales, time frames, and scopes. Uh, we try to uh, classify them into three categories. And as you can see, they are very varied in, in scale. However, they often intersected each other in dimension of mechanisms. So instead, we will tr try to talk about these mechanisms in this presentation. Um, first of all, we had the structural mechanisms that is often mentioned in the literature. Uh, and in this context, we talk about how structural change, uh, more precisely technology change, will initially cause divergence due to how regions are uh, differently equipped to handle technology technology change. Uh, however, this will often be followed by convergence as the technology matures and get more standardized, allowing other regions to catch up, uh, relating to how different externalities become more important as uh, technology standardized. Uh, the transition to the current knowledge economy uh, saw mainly three uh, causes in, in the literature. Uh, we have uh, a changing demand on labor uh, that has caused skill bias technology changed, which, as previously mentioned, has caused a greater spatial polarization between high skill and low skill jobs. Uh, we also seen that this has mainly benefited metropolitan areas that have had higher levels of human capital with agglomeration ex externalities that has facilitated uh, different forms of knowledge below us. Mm. And on the other hand, we also have had globalization processes that have seen a larger competition for the location of jobs, uh, but has also created new growth paths for, for certain regions. And this relates also to how re the regional and national context facilitate uh, the positive or negative benefits of uh, globalization. Uh, then, and these uh, regional or national uh, con uh, Contexts can be described by endogenous mechanisms, and uh, these are uh, uh, these vary a lot. So, and there is no real time to go through every one of these. But we have institutions uh, and equality of governance that can vary the relationship between economic development and inequality, where strong and healthy institution can mitigate the relationship between economic development and inequality by both enabling participation from many different social groups. Uh, it's also encouraging long-term growth. Then we have the effects from regional structures, uh, such as uh, path dependencies, uh, agglomeration externalities, uh, unrelated or var related variety that can encourage the performance of regions and its resilience to structural change. Uh, quite interesting, we also see that uh, there can be vastly different short and long-term effects of the levels of inequality where short-term effect can be enabling economic development and long-term effect be uh, kind of crippling to economic development by lowering the participation rate from certain social groups, uh, uh, decreasing social trusts, and so on. In terms of uh, inequality levels, we can see that the, uh, the return to human capital varied the relationship uh, between level of human capital and uh, inequality levels. Uh, we can also see that the size of the manufacturing sector matters for the level of inequality in cities and regions, where they often provide well-paid low-skill uh, low jobs that counteract the effect of high-skill jobs. Uh, we also find in the literature several mentions on uh, equilibrium mechanisms. We have on the one side equilibrium uh, general equilibrium models that focus on the inverted U curve, where they state that uh, 
inequality tends to converge after the economy has adapted to structural change. Uh, on the other hand, we also have spatial equilibrium models that states that the differences between regions tend towards a form of equilibrium, uh, but that this uh, spatial equilibrium can sh change during structural shifts, and there are different possible structural equilibrium uh, created during technology change. Uh, and then on to our empirical study, where we used uh, the LISA database from Statistics Sweden, which is a collection of registers on individual level that allow us to follow this uh, development of inequality and economic growth over time. Consists of, for example, employment registers or tax registers. Uh, it is also connected to a geographical uh, location, which can be extracted on a 250 by 250 meter grid which is consistent over time, which allows us to aggregate the results to different geographical uh, units, allowing to examine uh, the development across scale. One of these geographical uh, classifications are the municipality groups that we based on the hierarchical classification of municipalities by the Swedish Association of Local Authorities and Regions. This classification is based on the size of the largest settlement in the municipality and the commuting pa uh, patterns of the municipalities. And in this case, A regions predominantly commute to large cities, B regions to medium large cities, and C regions either commute to smaller cities or are uh, peripheral. And when we merge these into three distinguishable regions, we see that there is a, a, a large structural difference between them, basically predominantly seen in the difference in average population size. For inequality, we use the tidal inequality index that is belonging to the general entropy family and accounts for inequality between subgroups and within subgroups. Uh, for us, the notable features is that the between value is influenced by the number of subgroups and the expected uh, development when we move to more detailed scales is that the value will increase in size as the subgroups, the number of subgroups increases. Uh, and therefore, when we analyze the trend in tidal inequality index, we, we, we should not focus on the size, but rather the trend. Uh, so the findings, uh, the findings uh, could be divided into two categories. The ones we fo focus on the classification of the municipalities and the ones focus on the question of scale. The classification of municipality was mainly made to focus on the structural perspective on the regional development trends. Uh, and, we would con and we would show that we had two phases, one of divergence and one of convergence uh, over the last 30 years. This is best exemplified by the ratio of average income between regions, where we see that there are three phases, and a rather stable one during the financial crisis in the early 90s which was followed by a growing gap between larger regions and other regions during the tech bubble. Uh, and this ended around the dot-com crisis. And after that, we can see that there is some slight trend towards convergence between regions in income levels. When we then did a more detailed classification of it, it became clear that the largest increase in income over the entire of the time period was mainly felt in Stockholm followed by large cities and A regions. It becomes also very clear that this is very hierarchical uh, with larger regions uh, experiencing more growth during expansion phases. This was also reversed during the convergence trend where smaller cities and C regions uh, experiencing faster income growth. But employment growth, and then we looked at the employment growth to see if this was equal across the variables, here again, we see a more hierarchical uh, picture with large cities and Stockholm experiencing high levels of employment growth. We also see the picture that uh, Andreas talked about with smaller and more peripheral areas uh, experiencing fast decline in their employment uh, numbers for the entirety of the period. And then when we turn to the internal inequality, we find a very interesting picture where it was mainly in the metropolitan areas of Stockholm that saw increasing inequality during the time period. Uh, in contrast, smaller cities and uh, sea regions 
experienced a more uh, about convergence, uh, which together with the employment growth numbers uh, and the income growth numbers uh, led us to believe that there might be some form of process of being homogeneous in the smaller regions. And then we tried to see if this uh, was equal across scale uh, and asking uh, if, uh, this, if every scale told the same picture. So we did, it, we did a scatter plot looking at the relationship between the different variables. And here we can see that the grid level, uh, the 250 by 250 meter network, uh, had a myriad of relationships uh, and a very unclear correlation. However, when we did the classification, we saw that there was a, structural a slight structural difference between large and small regions, which are more clearly seen on the municipality level, but the most predominantly Stockholm has a more linear relationship between income and inequality growth. On the more aggregated scales of counties too, we can also see that there is a more clearer correlation, leading us to believe that there are some kind of difference in the, in the stories they tell. And this was confirmed when we looked at the between tile index value, where the grid level, interestingly, stopped following the general trend of the other scales, at the dot com crisis, where it instead of convergence, it had increasing uh, divergence between communities. And so we try to explore this further by looking at the uh, income distribution among the grids, uh, plotting it on a box plot over time. And here we see that the largest regions are mainly the cause for the increased variance uh, between grids. Uh, and we can also see that the smaller regions have remained uh, a about the same as 1990. Uh, and we can also see how it can be conflated when moving up aggregation since the median level and the difference between median uh, wage levels have been rather stable over the time period. So we made three important perspectives uh, from these results. And we firstly saw that stated that there was a structural pattern of the spatial uh, disparities with a phase of divergence that fall, uh, with the following convergence of the 2001. The findings on employment growth and income growth also made us to, to, to make a hypothesis that they, that might be due to dy a dynamic labor market that readjusts to changing demands and maybe causing a long-term balance in the terms of income levels as the labor, as labor real, reallocate between lagging regions and prospering regions. Uh, we also state that rising to personal inequality uh, might be a, mostly a metropolitan issue with Stockholm uh, undergoing a process of becoming more heterogeneous with increasing inequality levels, a uh, constant increase in labor market size, uh, and a constant income growth. In contrast, we have the smaller regions that had a near constant convergence in the income levels uh, that that are more homogeneous now than it was in 1990 and also had a constant decrease in the labor market size. Then we, uh, we also see that uh, the uneven development between neighborhoods tell us that there are different stories uh, across scales. And here it exemplifies by, the, by neighborhoods having no convergence between, between themselves uh, since 2001. Uh, even and even if we didn't really provide any uh, explanation to why this is happening, uh, we have uh, a slight uh, hint from the classification of municipalities that this is mainly due to the performance of metro some metropolitan areas. But it would be an interesting uh, research part for the future to understand why we have a convergence uh, on a regional level, uh, whilst we have communities that are more and more unequal. So in conclusion, uh, I would like to state that we have uh, three main points in the article. We see that there is an uneven development of regions that appears to follow a structural pattern, uh, mainly that we think is due to uh, the adaptation to a technology change. We see that we state that scale is an important factor to consider in the analysis of spatial disparities. Uh, here it is exemplified by how grids tell us a different story than other regional levels. Uh, and which exemplifies uh, the need to, uh, to be more uh, dynamic in their use of scale. Uh, 
We also see that rising inequality is a mainly metropolitan issues, where smaller regions are becoming more homogeneous, uh, while Stockholm especially have become more heterogeneous. Uh, and altogether, it, it, it encouraged further research avenues uh, to examine possible explanations to why the pattern of increasing difference between communities are occurring at the same time as an overall interregional convergence. Uh, and here I have the references that we have been using. Uh, and otherwise, I just want to thank you for the time and be glad to answer any further questions. Thank you, Andreas, for the presentation and the European long-term perspective. Um, are there any questions for clarification? Anything to Andrea? Currently, there's nothing in the system. I would have one question myself, which is not really for clarification, but it's more um, uh, on, on the topic already. Because, And uh, sometimes I'm a little bit wondering um, if you have a look, and many others, and myself as well, um, on the development of uh, regional uh, inequalities, uh, so inside a region between uh, individuals, an, an increase uh, or decrease uh, in inequality might be the result of uh, the poorer gaining, for example, income, wage, whatever, or the um, those with more income, better wages, um, um, uh, leaving the area, for example, or losing. Both would, in the end, affect uh, the level of inequality and lead to a decrease in inequality, right? Yeah. Um, so the question is, that. sometimes uh, a change in inequality um, might not be overall a, a positive uh, development because uh, the, the uh, richer people leave the area, for example. So uh, uh, that's the general question, I think. Um, uh, it would be interesting, in my view, to add uh, more or less uh, by which pro progress um, the uh, decrease in inequality uh, was generated. So by the, the poorer increasing their uh, income or by the richer decreasing their income or leaving the region. So that would be a question whether you have controlled uh, for uh, the direction of this progress. Well, uh, I might, uh, as we saw in the box plot uh, before, we, we saw that the at least low income uh, groups, uh, uh, communities uh, for each region remained relatively stable. Uh, the main causes uh, in that uh, scale, at least, was larger income groups, uh, higher income groups gaining more income. So in that way, we have tried to look for it. Yeah. And I hope that answers your question somewhat. Yeah, and, and the other way around. Uh, so the, uh, the people in the rich area or the rich people in the metropolitan area gained. But what about the other way around, where the uh, inequality decreased? Um, what we can what, what we can say uh, is that it is at least that the uh, the uh, smaller regions was relatively unchanged. Uh, so I would guess maybe it's because of uh, people exiting the uh, labor market or labor reallocation since we had decreasing employment growth. But otherwise, other than that, we haven't really uh, done much uh, uh, follow up, and that would be a further research avenue, at least. Okay. So no questions for clarification right now. So um, thank you. We have an um, ongoing discussion after the third presenter. So I would give the floor to Jennifer Clark, um, switching back to the uh, US perspective. Um, and she wants to present parts of her very new book. Uh, she's professor and head of the city and regional planning section of Ohio State University. Um, so we are looking forward to this um, interesting new part of the puzzle. Jennifer, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I am going to share my screen. It will take me a moment to uh, make it all work. Okay, wonderful. Hopefully we can all see this. Yes, <laughs> excellent. Um, so uh, I have um, 
I'm I'm a little punchy this morning and a little uh, have a little uh, anxiety. And um, whenever I see uh, the uh, analysis that Andres Andres just presented, uh, jump the pond and come to uh, to the U.S. Uh, it it, uh, it creates a little anxiety to see it so close to home. Um, and so uh, I look forward to that conversation too. Um, and I appreciate the conversation about um, sort of the ass the assessment of a. Uh, of inequalities here and the mapping, uh, particularly of, of how we think about inequalities and identifying the political implications of them. What I'm going to be talking about is a, a little bit of a different story, which is how we get to some of these inequalities uh, in the first place uh, through choices that we make and paths we choose in terms of uh, disinvestment and various kinds of uh, investment. So I start this conversation, and indeed this is a, a much uh, larger uh, uh, project um, than I'll be able to present here. Um, but really, I, I think it's helpful to sort of uh, talk a little bit about how someone who's an academic expert on cities and regional economies and innovation systems and industrial clusters like I am, um, why it is I got involved in approaching uh, this the analysis of smart cities. and. I did that in part and am doing that in part because um, as an economic geographer, the Smart Cities Project to me looked a lot like the evolution of other industries and uh, the diffusion of enabling technologies. It looked like other things that I'd seen and most of the analyses of smart cities that I had seen or the urban technology project as I call it, really did not look at it as a question of industry. There was a lot of complexity in the presentation but not a lot of analysis from, from the perspective of what did this mean as, as sort of an economic geography project and the spatial distribution of economic activity including the inequalities that resulted from it. So from that lens, it became clear to me very quickly that the city is actually has a particular role in the urban technology project um, as part of the production process, as, as sort of a site and a platform for the production of this industry. Um, and that, had, uh, that meant that there were distinct implications for both creating new inequalities and exacerbating old ones in no small part because the deploy deployment of the smart cities um, objects, projects, systems were not conceptualized and not discussed as having the ability to create or, or exacerbate uh, existing inequalities. In fact, it was really always presented and still the smart cities technologies are presented as a set of, uh, of technology interventions that largely uh, can mitigate inequalities uh, rather than uh, exacerbate or create new ones. And that really struck me as one of those interesting things about directionality, right? That the idea that the direction here of this intervention could only lead only lead up, only go better. And it reminded me um, of the, the, the line that the greatest trick the devil, devil ever pulled uh, was convincing the world that he didn't exist. So, you know, when we talk about the tech sector and their ability to do just pretty amazing, amazing marketing, uh, the idea of creating the, the, uh, the conceptual um, discussion around smart cities as one that, that went only in one direction was a pretty remarkable um, accomplishment. So um, I started, got busy looking at what was actually missing from the, uh, the urban innovation project, the urban technology project. And uh, in doing that, it became clear to me that this was a little bit more complicated than the conversations we generally have about it. And it was complicated because the, 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 the tech sector had learned to obscure not only its motivations, but its operations across many of sectors over time that were relevant to this uh, Smart Cities project. Uh, First, um, the idea that, uh, that there had not been much of a public debate or a conversation about uh, alternative revenue streams, like what is actually the revenue stream uh, 
what is the model for making money um, from smart cities projects. And it really turned out that, and it is increasingly turning out, and we'll talk about this, that this has a lot to do with traditional economic development. It has traditional economic development around real estate development. And this is an example right here of some of the real estate development uh, around uh, the smart cities project, but also around data extraction and revenue models around uh, data extraction. So here we had intangible assets and tangible assets intermingled and in creating sort of more innovative uh, financial products, something we're not unfamiliar with in uh, the analysis uh, that we do in economic geography. Um, also that there had not been much of a critique, and this goes to the issue of public versus private um, a, a technology diffusion projects. There had not been much of a discussion of uh, whether or not um, we should be thinking about the development of these technologies as consumed by users. So using sort of the tech sector's uh, um, language around product and prototyping and product development, rather than thinking about citizens. So this idea that we're talking about when we're developing products products for consumers rather than citizens has a fairly big distinction. Um, also this idea that there had not been a lot of discussion about who governs and how governing of the project uh, was actually going to happen or the small scale projects. And if you think about things like the, the proliferation of uh, scooters, uh, particularly competing, you know, e electronic scooters in cities or electronic bikes, particularly in the US, there's been very little governance of, of how these deployments work. And then this and the idea of a power analysis around um, the cities as a prototyping platform. We saw this in Toronto. There's a real confusion about the idea of if cities are actually part of the production process, if they are a necessary territory uh, for the purposes of prototyping these technology products, then what is their power in negotiating uh, with firms about that prototyping? Um, and then finally, uh, it, it seemed to me uh, that there was a, a, a lack of discussion about the work of smart cities. And that's why the book has that subtitle. And by that, I mean both the question of the work it takes to implement smart cities projects and govern them and manage them and think about them, but also the work that's done in smart cities, whether that's the work that we do um, through gig labor, uh, whether that's that whole echelon of sort of contingent gig work, or if that's actually the, the sort of by the other side of the bifurcation, uh, the idea of, of sort of a, a technology enabled work the kind of work from home that we uh, now see as, as such a big part of our, our lives today in the pandemic environment. So this is then uh, the, uh, the book itself in the five uh, premises that dominate the discussion there. So what I tried to do was come up with sort of an alternative framework of how to think about smart cities that looked at it through th this lens of understanding the inequalities, but also understanding that there is an ability to provide an alternative approach to implementation. So it's not a critique alone, it's a critique <laughs> In, a, in, in addition to recommendations for a way forward. So the first part of the premise is really this idea uh, that uneven innovation is, a, some, is both something we've seen before and also something that we're going through. So, I mean, obviously the book is, a, a, um, in terms of conceptual design, uh, speaks to and refers back to uneven development and part of the discussion in the book is that the sort of uh, the buzz around smart cities of thinking about technology as being beyond our ability to an analyze it because the technologies are new is not in fact a, a rational response to, uh, to this proposition. Um, many of the technologies are not new <laughs> and really what's the most new about this is the implementation within a public sector space. Um, particularly a public uh, sector space governed by by local uh, like by local governments. So the second premise is a, a, a recognition and understanding that the tech sector needs the city as a source of subsidy and risk reduction. So that that you actually see the tech sector uh, uh, exploit uneven innovation 
as well as, as trying to maintain it. And this is the same sort of jurisdictional competition that we see through traditional economic development relationships between place and industry. Again, the Smart Cities uh, project is also enabled by what um, at Nick Theodore and Jamie Peck call fast policy, which is really a combination of a devolution plus policy mobilities that circumvent traditional models of policy transfer. So typically in public policy, we often see an evaluation component when there's a prototype of a project. Here, we're not seeing that. What we see typically is one city picks up a policy or a project, and then another city wants it next. So that evaluation of cost benefit analysis, that evaluation of relative um, of, of understanding you know, opportunity costs of one sort of intervention versus another doesn't happen in a, in a deliberative, consistent way. Um, fourth, that the Smart Cities Project itself uh, exacerbates and amplifies precarious work, uh, embedding labor flexibility in the production operations of the built environment. And by that, what I mean is that the, the Smart Cities Project, because of how it deploys technologies, is in fact uh, creating a more precarious labor environment, is in fact enabling what firms themselves started 35, 40 years ago. And now the platform, the city as the technology platform is enabling things like gig work to happen. And then finally, the, this point about the data, which is that, uh, and this goes back to the revenue model, that the data that's extracted through the, uh, through the, smart, the deployment of smart cities projects and objects and systems is actually a big part of the product. <laughs> it's a big part and it's a, and it's a big part of what ultimately the revenue model is supposed to be, but it is under construction. And I think the Toronto project demonstrates that with Sidewalk Labs pretty well, is the idea that the revenue model is uncertain, but it's clear that the data is a, is a core component of, of that monetization. So one of the things that's changed that's really interesting, I think, from, some, from somebody who has my um, academic background is that we used to talk about, um, it, it, about places being in competition with each other and having competitive advantages based on a specialization that not everybody else had. So whether it was you know uh, cars in Detroit or rubber in Akron, I'm sitting in Ohio, so I can say that, <laughs> or, or whether it was Silicon Valley and software, you know, different places had different capacities. The thing that's really interesting about what's going on with the Urban Technology Project is it's pushing places to compete with each other based on tech as the specialization, undifferentiated, unspecified tech. And that has to do with both the question of, com of competition between spaces, sort of the permissiveness around competition uh, around spaces for projects, but it also has to do with sort of an undifferentiated, undifferentiated high tech labor market specialization. So now we get to this idea of platforms for what? <laughs> the idea of that what we're, one of the things that's happening in the Urban Technology Project is obscuring the boundaries around uh, urban innovation and uh, smart cities. And those are distinct uh, ideas. So we do see some really interesting ha things happening within urban innovation spaces, one of which is the commitment to or recommitment to local uh, production and technology development. And you see this in, in ideas like, um, this is the Brooklyn Navy Yards. You see this in the idea of localized um, dy dynamic and diverse tendencies around food production and retail, craft-based production, maker spaces. This idea that there's actually something to be done about local production and local production systems that are tech intensive or really enabled through te new technologies. That's a different thing than what, what the Smart Cities Project is, is doing per se. And then some of this idea that it, it looks more like research centers and, and more like the, the, the dialogue we've had in, in the field around technology transfer, research centers, research inc incubators, this is closer to, to that area. And then we see the uh, platforms that are more close to not production per se or making per se, but are closer to the real estate redevelopment um, um, model that's being enabled here. 
And that's things like Chelsea Market here. I'm sure many of you have been there in New York City. Um, and this is Ponce City Market on the, on the other side, which is in Atlanta. And you note that they don't look that much different in this presentation. That's not just because I laid them out this way. It's because they're literally done by the same German, uh, the German uh, real estate firm who has learned how to sort of create this authenticity space, this technology enabled authentic spaces. And these are then the platforms and, and spaces where we see uh, smart cities projects and objects then uh, deployed. So you see in terms of inequalities, this, this concentration upon concentration of technology assets, of technology infrastructure in specific spaces within cities. So some test beds get the technologies, other places have to wait. So if you're talking about having the tech, if, if you're talking about infrastructure investment and sort of the history of infrastructure investment, this follows the pattern of infrastructure investment where rich places keep getting more toys and poor people and poor places and, and places that are not commercially uh, dynamic don't get those same, same technology toys. From an inequality perspective, what that means is that you don't have the platform, right? If you don't have the technology assets, you don't have the platform for the economic development that emerges and depends upon those uh, technology assets. So because this is an iterative question around platforms and infrastructure, the lack of the even distribution of these technology assets has very different implications than, than some of the things we've seen in the past. And here you can see how some of this is playing out in the tensions between traditional economic development um, uh, strategies and competition between cities and, uh, and sort of the newly enhanced technology, tech as the, the specialization approaches. This is the, the uh, what I'm sure everyone is familiar with, the Amazon uh, search for their second headquarters where they pitted places against each other. Um, and then uh, and then the selection, we, we can talk later about the selection. Um, but, the, but again, it was about being a, a, an authentic place for this, for this, uh, for this, this technology production. And we see again and again, um, the, the forays of firms into different ways to create technology spaces and particularly urban regeneration projects that create the platform, create the space for their own product and prototype development within cities. So I think you know I I, I always want to make sure that I, I remember to, to <laughs> emphasize the labor market com component uh, of this too because I think that this is really important. When I had first started working on this, I had looked at it from through the lens of co-working um, and how co-working was sort of moving people away uh, from their their workplaces and into these shared spaces and shifting the risks and costs of the provisioning of workspaces and all of those services and assets that are required to do that, shifting those to the individual worker and away from the firm. So the firm stops uh, providing uh, not only the workspace but you know the computer, <laughs> the electricity, <laughs> the you know the water fountain, all of these other things. Right now, when we look at this from the pandemic perspective, we see this as well. We see this as sort of, you know, the amped up um, a, a component of how this is, how uh, uh, it, workers are now bearing the costs as we sit in our homes uh, of, of uh, being able to do our work and our firms are not uh, bearing that cost. For now, it's, it seems like a very positive thing in the sense that it keeps us safe. Um, going forward in the future, the question of whether or not the infrastructure is sufficient in cities to allow people to do this um, across the board or it only people who are within those spaces where that technology has been properly deployed will be able to participate in the career, careers and jobs um, that require that. So no, all is not lost. Um, I, it, there are alternative futures here that can be pursued that can mitigate inequalities and, and uh, increase the, the, uh, the, um, the beneficial outcomes that can come from, uh, from uh, deploying these, these necessary technologies as infrastructure. One of them has to do with data and governance and having a much more um, affirmative approach. And this is a particularly a big issue in the US. 
uh, of uh, about ownership uh, of, of data and governance of it, uh, extracted data extracted through smart cities projects about the, the individuals um, and and uh, operations. So there's one um, way to think about this, which is uh, that it's not just about ownership; it's about use and it's about governance. And we can take a page from the uh, disability rights movements when they say nothing about us without us. That there may def there may be time here to still talk about how the data should not be managed without the consent and knowledge of the people from whom it was gathered. Um, second, that there are uh, participatory processes out there for, for governance, for, for greater participation and sort of upgrading uh, the, the participatory planning processes is uh, with new technology would be great. It would be a great way to, to, um, to really help set priorities and local tailoring as these project in terms of selection of investments and projects. And then writing work back into the urban technology pro project and understanding that work is a big part of what's being transformed as we transform the technology platform that is the city. And with that, um, I would be happy to take uh, uh, questions uh, from the group. Thank you. Thank you, even ahead of time. So we have quite a lot of time for uh, discussion. Um, but let's first start, as in the other two cases, with uh, direct uh, questions of understanding to Jennifer. Are there any clarification questions? Currently not. Um, I've seen, and probably you have seen as well, that uh, ah, um, Andres has already answered quite a lot of questions uh, uh, by uh, writing. But we have a new question to Jennifer and Andres um, by Nicola Love. Uh, can you open the question answer button? Or I can post a button, uh, question to you if you like. Andres, do you want to answer first? I mean, I can, I can let Jennifer uh, go first. I think I'll be okay. answering it. So, Jennifer. Yeah, and then... I, I'm reading it in real time. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> So what are, what are your thoughts on the claims that smaller cities and towns might benefit from the dispersal of workers from data focused tech giants that are no longer requiring workers to stay in cities? Will that result in similar forms of precariousness, increasing inequality earns? Oh, okay. <laughs> we had this question yesterday already a little bit at least. So that's following us. So what's your answer or your guess maybe? Uh, yeah, I, my, I mean, honestly, the technology is not well defined in the US. I mean, I do think that this is contingent on how good, on how good the uh, infrastructure is. And the infrastructure is not that great, you know, as you know, uh, in, in quite a few places. So I think that that's, um, this, this does have something to do with it quite a bit is the, is the question of whether or not so uh, if we continue to have the uneven deployment of the technologies, it's impossible to run a Zoom <laughs> meeting with more than five people in some places in the country without everyone freezing. Uh, I think there is absolutely no way for this to be the, this to, to work. But I do think it creates pressure. Um, I think it absolutely creates pressure on the federal government and state governments about the question of what the baseline level of services should be. And that's a good conversation to have. Okay, so if I, if I may intervene a bit, I think this is a, a very important question and I think we're putting probably too much hope in the idea that the pandemic is going to shake up the territorial organization that we have at the moment. In a, in a recent paper with uh, Michael Storper, who I guess in the, in the chat and uh, uh, Richard Florida and I have highlighted that the likelihood that we will return to a system that is relatively similar in, in terms of uh, urban and territorial hierarchies to the one we have at the, or we had before the pandemic in a relatively short period of time is uh, is uh, high on on that would mean that there would be no significant change but there's a, probably a more uh, important change which is linked to the questions of automations that came uh, before is this idea that we are now in a, in a situation where the new dynamic firms tend to hire much less employees. Uh, 
1970, the second largest firm in the world was uh, General Motors, and General Motors had a hundred thousand workers working for it, and it had value chains uh, upstream and downstream that were really important and that created uh, a significant linkages with plants in not just across the United States, but in virtually every single country in the developed world and in many developing countries. Uh, today, the equivalent would be Facebook. And Facebook, despite the fact that it's increasing the number of employees rapidly, I think it uh, has about 50, well, 100,000 employees possibly uh, right now, most of them concentrated in one place, which is the, the Bay Area, and with very few, despite having a lot of offices, employees in other parts of the United States or the world. So even if they push their 50,000 employees to go and move somewhere else, the impact on the dynamism of, let's say, declining cities, places that don't matter, is going to be very limited. Even if we go to Amazon, Amazon has a million employees, uh, most of them concentrated in the United States, but it's shaking, it's growing like crazy in retail in Europe. And retail and wholesale in Europe represent 15% of the whole workforce. So in this respect, what we're going to see is that this is going to reinforce the concentration of returns and wealth in dynamic areas, in where these firms are located, where they pay their taxes, but the majority of other places are likely to lose out. So if we see anything, it's probably going to see a greater polarization of society, greater territorial polarization, and probably a period of uh, even greater political and social uncertainty like we have seen over the last few years. Maybe I can add uh, two questions uh, uh, from Marianne. Uh, she asked uh, Andres whether there might be a link between um, the development of social capital and uh, the age cohort. So maybe uh, the younger people or the elder ones uh, are especially um, unsatisfied with the uh, social situation and maybe uh, engaging or not engaging and producing social capital. So the question is whether you uh, controlled or might be able to control um, for these uh, age effects. That would be one question. And a general question probably to everybody, because we had this uh, yesterday uh, already, uh, move to the big cities. Uh, so um, if the cities and the large cities uh, with uh, multinational digital monopolies located there, um, dominate uh, the development uh, so strongly, uh, what about the rest of the country? So are there really lost places or, or um, are there other developments as well uh, helping them to uh, catch up uh, to, the, to the dominant cities? So that's the first one is a question to Andres, so the second one is more a question to uh, all of the panel. So should I go first or? Yeah, please. Okay, on the age effects, I think this is um, a very important question. I haven't, just uh, for the sake of clarity, I haven't control for age effects. It's something that could be done, but I haven't done it so far, uh, but it's very relevant. And I think this is very much related to the question that Nicola put in the chat before, which is about uh, whether the definition of social capital that is being used, and Michael as well, is the right one. And I think Putnam has a definition of social capital uh, that is based on associationalism and personal face-to-face -face associations in clubs, which might, or in political parties, political groups, uh, trade unions, which might have reflected the America that was, or the Europe that was, or the world that was, but is no longer reflective of the, the, the world that is, and especially of how young people interact. It's not that young people have less social capital than older citizens. They have different forms of social capital that we're not capturing. And they have formal social capital that through associationalism, as Michael was saying in his question, might be reflecting more conservative social values, more values that are, let's say, more reactive to any type of changes. Uh, so what we should do is strive to try to measure social capital in a way that is far more accurate for the 20th century, for 2020, uh, including other forms of relations that would go from social media to all the multiple channels in which we as individuals these days have to generate our social capital that go beyond uh, 
uh, levels of uh, formal association because I would consider myself as someone with a very, very strong uh, level of social capital and a lot of networks and relationships, but I'm afraid I'm not a member of any club or of any association or of any political party. And in that respect, my social capital, according to the definition that comes from Putnam and that I use in my paper, would be close to zero. Okay, thank you. Maybe uh, the second question to Jennifer and Andreas, and there's another one uh, for Jennifer uh, in the uh, question and answer uh, system. So maybe uh, you start first uh, with this uh, question from the uh, question and answer system, and maybe you can add to the question whether big cities get it all. <laughs> okay, you have to, so which question am I answering first? <laughs> Please, the one uh, by, from Zara, uh, Zara Lawrence. Um. Oh, okay, excellent. Oh, thank you. That that I can see. <laughs> um, thank you, thank you, Sarah. Um, this is this is a really help. I I find this fascinating too. <laughs> so, so um, I guess I guess what I would say from from the the, the gig workers uh, conversation, there's a bunch of people who who write really nice, do some really nice work on precarious work. Um, and the the and understanding um, how precarious uh, at work has sort of evolved. The idea of of what, how the the smart city facilitates that that's a reasonably um, uh, a recent I, a conceptualization. Um, I, I Nicola actually Nicola Lowe has a book coming out about um, about work in the next. I think she can pop in here and tell us in the next six months or so. And I think that's probably a good place to look. There's a great um, book by Mark Dussard called Degraded Work. These are these are mostly focused on the on the U.S. context. Chris Benner does great work from California uh, around the, this issue of how it's evolved in the tech sector, and I rely heavily um, it on. Uh, oh, excellent! Nicholas presenting in the next section. See, you can get the full. <laughs> stay tuned. I'm already doing plugs for the next section. Um, but the, the uh, Chris Benner, who's in California, does some nice work looking at how this has evolved in the tech sector too, but not specifically about how the cities are playing a role in that. So that whole part of the of the conversation, I think, is, is part of what is um, is being unpacked. And you know, I start trying to unpack in the book. Um, but yeah. That's that's probably the best I can do for you on that right this second. And uh, the more general question, uh, whether you see a chance for uh, uh, areas outside the big cities uh, to uh, really gain uh, in status employment and decrease uh, the gap to the large cities uh, with their, um, for example, uh, tech firms. Um, yeah, that's a question. I I actually agree uh, on this one. <laughs> I just I mean there is a lot of discussion in the U.S. about this idea of our our cities going to become sort of less concentrated, less important, less attractive. I just don't see that happening. I, I think I don't see that that the COVID is going to destabilize uh, this the sort of the power dynamic. I think it's more likely to exacerbate it as. A, 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 that than any of <laughs> and and a part of that has to do with, with something that's really fairly simple which is the distribution of healthcare assets in the US so it it, it is very difficult to get very get quality healthcare outside of a central metro area in the U um, and it has gotten worse over time. So, you know, we may be thinking about things like people might not want to be at cities, might lower um, uh, real estate prices, all of this sort of thing. But that's coupled, you know, that's weighed against the issue of would I actually like to get medical care? Should I get sick? That, that's that's a, of, of, of a caliber that, that can give you some um, assurance. So I do think that that's, that's another factor to keep in mind is that the, the concentration of assets, even assets like healthcare, are highly concentrated in wealthy areas, and wealthy areas are cities. Okay. Andreas, uh, you analyzed the data for Sweden, and uh, as you showed us, uh, the development looks a little bit different with some convergence the last years. So maybe you can add to this question. <laughs> 
Uh, well, I mean, first of all, it's a, com it's a complex question, and if we had a good answer to it, I think this would have solved a lot of the societal problems we have. Uh, but I would say that we have, in Sweden at least, we have individual su success stories out in the smaller or more peripheral regions uh, that kind of speaks the contrary to, uh, to, to what we are talking about. Uh, often they are related to some form of large industry that are located there. Uh, but overall, I would think that we should have a more dynamic view uh, on on the more rural areas, and to think maybe maybe they don't have to be the the prime drivers for economic growth. But as long as we are providing with a good welfare system for uh, for individuals in these regions, and they are overall uh, feeling a form of inclusion in the general uh, development of the country, then we are succeeding in some way. And maybe that's the policy that should in the focus okay so we see a different development at least in in the us and at least in sweden uh we came to one reason for this and that's the healthcare system uh, um, but are there more reasons why the development might be different in the us and in in europe or sweden let's let's focus on sweden do you have any idea on this how these differences come about if, if I may, I'm going to link it to your previous question. And the idea is, uh, first, I don't think that there is that much of a difference in developments between the US and Europe. I think that there's potential everywhere I'm going to go back. But linking it to your previous question, the idea is, what is, what is the future for intermediate cities, uh, small towns and rural areas? And if I were an urban economist, which I'm not, I would say, well, the future is mainly in the big cities and that's not really a problem. People should move to, to opportunity and that is going to benefit everyone. Uh, I don't think that's the case. I mean, there are plenty of uh, cases of big cities that have done very well, plenty of cases of big cities that are not doing particularly well. And a city like London that was has done very well over the last 30 years had 70 years of decline before that. Um, I do think that there's future and the debate is wrong. This idea is not that we need to empty the big cities in order to uh, promote the development of small and medium sized cities. Uh, what we have is a situation whereby big cities are probably going to do in general uh, relatively well, regardless of what happens and they're going to be able to if they are more resilient to shocks in, in any case. If we want to promote the potential that exists in intermediate cities and smaller cities in rural areas. We need to try not to think about or keep on thinking about their relationship with big cities, but what can we get from this? And this is where I think there's no big difference between the US and between uh, Europe. In Europe, some of the most dynamic firms in recent years have come from relatively remote places. Uh, Ikea in Sweden from Onsvot uh, Inditex uh, from Artesio in, in Spain, not from Madrid, not from Stockholm, not from Malmo even. So there's potential everywhere. In the United States, uh, Walmart doesn't come from San Francisco, or doesn't come from uh, uh, New York, it comes from Arkansas. So what we're having is that there's potential, but this potential has been left in harness because we have tended to believe and in fact, we have many of us in academia have promoted this idea that these places have got relatively small future or less future than other places. And on top of that, uh, we have uh, policy has been trying to invest in those areas that have been deemed to have greater potential. But it's been shown that in the case of Europe, at least a uh, bigger investment, especially in human capital and in innovation and in competitiveness and entrepreneurship in areas that have been left behind, that have attracted, has promoted not just economic dynamism, but has lowered the level of discontent. So if rather than saying, do we need to empty the big cities to promote development elsewhere, we focus on what can be done in order to harness the potential that we have in these places, we would probably be going a long way in order to try to generate a territorial system that is not just more even and more fair, but one that provides uh, for better uh, economic and higher economic growth, and also for a better well-being for citizens wherever they live. Okay. I would just like to, to uh, underscore that 
<laughs> and say that I, there is there is also a, a, a very a, an existing literature in the U.S. about um, smaller cities, and I think that there is a, it's reasonable to to make the distinction that that the question of small cities and rural development is is quite different from the question of cities between two hundred and fifty and uh, 2 million, right? So usually when we're looking at the US, we're typically taught, we have a whole lot of cities <laughs> that are between about 250 and, and 2 million. And we think of those as the smaller, <laughs> the smaller cities many times. And then there's the category of, you know, 100,000 and, and under, and that's a really, really different game, right? In terms of the policy story and the economic development piece. In terms of this issue of specialization, there is a long history in the US of cities of that 250 under 2 million size who have really impressive uh, industries and, and, and innovation processes that, and specializations. And so part of my frustration when, when I was doing this work about, you know, the, the smart cities piece was this idea of distilling it down to just being undifferentiated tech as being the specialization had implications for those cities. So those mid-tier cities, mid-sized cities that to me seem really problematic from a policy perspective about how we think about investment in things like medical devices in Minneapolis or um, uh, you know, innovative activewear in Portland, Oregon, or if we think about you know, the, these different sorts of specializations that, that actually are part of the story of the development, Rochester and optics and photonics, the story of, of how we see wealth built in smaller cities over time. I, I mean, we, we know this uh, picture from Germany. I mean, quite a lot of uh, successful uh, German firms or hidden champions are located in rural areas or quite sm uh, weakly uh, populated areas. But still, especially these firms now have uh, some problems to find highly qualified uh, human capital. Um, so uh, you, you just said uh, that human capital infrastructure uh, uh, plays an uh, important role, um, but even a successful firm uh, has some problems uh, to gain this um, access, uh, starting from uh, the CEO going down to the uh, normal worker, uh, the blue collar worker somewhere. Uh, and so that's really a problem for uh, successful firms in rural areas. So. Um, that's, uh, that's probably some policy issues uh, everybody has to tackle, but uh, that's uh, probably uh, especially true for uh, successful uh, firms in non-agglomerated areas, because uh, everybody wants to go uh, to more uh, agglomerated uh, cities with more, um, uh, more uh, bars, pubs, restaurants, theaters, and so on. Um, there's one question uh, still in the question and answer uh, system. I'm, I'm not really sure uh, what the answer to this might be, whether we have to prolong uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, to change really something uh, with regard to regional inequality. Um, you already answered part of this question because you said uh, currently there's no much long-term change uh, related to the pandemic, uh, but uh, maybe still coming back to the question, if there's a specific development, uh, maybe uh, a longer period of time or other circumstances, do you think that there might be an effect or do you think as you, uh, at least Andres already said, um, there's probably no, no long-term effect at all. Would you like to start? Yes, uh, thank you very much. And thank you very much to Scott for, for the question. Um, of course, the, the impact and territorial impact of the pandemic is going to be very much related to the length of the pandemic and to how long we try and finding a permanent solution with a, a vaccine or the pandemic might go away like it did uh, with the uh, so-called uh, Spanish flu in the, between 1918 and 1920. Uh, having said that, I mentioned that I don't think that there's going to be significant changes in the macro geography, uh, regardless of the length, unless it's very long. But at the level of micro geography, what happens within cities, probably changes are going to be far more significant in the short term. Uh, based on three forces, on the one, uh, the first force would be uh, the whole uh, issue of uh, the, the fear of the social scarring of the pandemic. 
that we are behaving differently in how we relate, how we, uh, uh, because of uh, the, the fear of contagion. The transformation of physical space within cities that uh, is associated to the adoption of uh, measures uh, to uh, guarantee safety and the results of this social experiment in which overnight we all had to start working from home and start shopping from home, etc. And I think these three factors in combination, especially the last one, the social experiment, are going to have significant implications for how the microgeography of cities that uh, probably there's going to be a change in the use of uh, uh, CBDs and space within city centers. There's going to be a continuation of the retail apocalypse that was already uh, underway because of the challenges of automation platform economies that uh, have been highlighted by Jennifer and others in the past. There's going to be a uh, less need for offices in the center because there's going to be a more of an aversion to commuting. There's going to be, people have decided that perhaps working from home several days a week might be an option and companies might save money. And that might mean that at least in the short term, uh, suburbs and the outskirts of cities might win uh, to, uh, relative to the center but the center might redefine and rebuild itself. It might attract other types of people. It might become more affordable. It might bring in uh, younger people, more creative people, more entrepreneurial people. And it might also lead to add other types of events. So there might be a real transformation of the city, at least in the medium term with the new functions. And here, what we should strive is to, to create a sort of new urbanism within the cities that would be far more just and less prone to improving or increasing the inequalities that we have uh, than the system that has been in place uh, for quite some time in the Western world. Okay. Jennifer, Andreas, do, would you like to add or? I would just say that uh, I think, you know, looking at it from the, the, the US experience, the 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 bottom is getting much lower. <laughs> so if you say if we're talking about inequality, one of one of the things that's that's really happening is uh, we've got a, a million women have left the labor market. Children can't get to they can't get online to to regularly participate in school um, services. Uh, so the use uh, uh, the talking about the the use of public services because municipal budgets are under such stress we aren't seeing the, the public sector able to sort of step up and provide that safety net that's going to be needed as more and more people drop out of the labor market because of the responsibilities that they have at, at home. So I think if, you know, the question of how long this COVID and how much that's, it's not clear to me that it's gonna create a lot of this, it, the inter-regional <laughs> inequality question is a different question than the question of within regions, whether the bottom's gonna fall out for a lot of people who were living at sort of at the margins in the first, you know, before this started. And that's gonna put real pressure in terms of services that need to be provided as at, from a social welfare perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay. Andreas, would you like to add or? I would just want to add that there, there's probably different long-term effects depending on what kind of policies are in place. Uh, we see that in Sweden they have uh, uh, tried to keep schools open. I think that one of, is one of the crucial factors for the uh, long-term uh, effects of on children, at least in the more poor, poor areas of cities. Um, so yeah, I think on the regional level, I have I don't have a clue right now on, on how it will would go so, okay yeah. are there currently there are no additional questions so let me thank all of you for the presentations and the um, very interesting and active discussion um, we will have a break now and i would suggest that we extend the break a little bit and uh, start as planned uh, a quarter past 10 or whatever time you currently have, so a quarter past the hour. Um, we will have the next session, which is uh, moderated by Torben Klaal, and we have again uh, three presentations um, on uh, very different aspects of uh, 
regional inequality and factors leading to regional inequality. So have a nice break, relax a little bit, and then let's start uh, with uh, new energy in the next session. So see you then. Bye-bye.